Virgin Radio Classic Rock, Ross Williams here, and it's a great pleasure to have in the studio the rock legend that is Meatloaf. Meat, welcome to... Oh, those are okay. kind words. Thank you very much. So, um, Batch out of Hell 4, is it going to happen? Not a prayer. You probably, <laughs> but you probably said that about number three. No. Really? No, no. Always, always, uh, for, um, easily, since sometime 80, 85, we always said there would be a two and a three. Never a number four. No. It will never happen. No, it was always meant to be uh, the three. Uh, it wasn't originally, but in 85, um, we decided to do two. And it took eight years to get it done. And, and then uh, after two, we decided we'd do three. And that took, I don't know how many years that took, so. That's why. But no, no four. No four. <laughs> Let's just go back to pre-Bat Out of Hell. Um, let us into the the secret if it is one of, of how you actually got, got the job of being meatloaf and working with Jim and and and, and you know making that out. Well, I've been called you. I didn't get the job of meatloaf. I've been called meat You've since I was nine meat. months old, and um, Dad called me meat. Everybody they either called me ML initials ML or meat, and uh, so that was that. And and Jim Steinman. I met Jim Steinman because I, I did theater in New York and I met Jim Steinman at the public theater. He was, they were doing a, a play by Michael Weller. It was a workshop play for Joe Papp in the public theater. And uh, they had decided to put a, one song in this play. And the song was called More Than You Deserve. And, and the reason they decided to put one the song is because uh, Joe Papp was in love with Jim Steinman. So he was trying to find something for Jim Steinman to do. And so he, t I don't think Michael Weller really wanted the song in the play. And, but Joe Pat was the king uh, of New York theater. And so he did that and I came in and I sing a song called I'd Love to Be As Heavy As Jesus. And uh, the, the first, I only sang it for Jim. He was the only person in the room. And he said, hang on for a second, I'll be right back. And they were gone for 20 minutes. And I was ready to go, so this is stupid. And all of a sudden, this whole army of people came in and uh, said, will you do that again? And I did it again. And then Joe Papp, who ran public theater, said, we, I want you to go with him. And he went to the gym and go across the hall, and he's going to show you this chorus and this song. And let's come back and sing this chorus. Went across the hall, we learned the chorus of One You Deserve, came back and sang it for Joe, and, he, and so he, he turned to the playwright, I would assume that would have been Michael Weller, and he said, give, you know, give me a script, and he gave me a script, and he goes, go home, and he, there's all these soldiers in there, you tell me which soldier you'd like to play, and it's the first time I'd ever been given a script, and uh, I picked out, the soldier that I picked out, he was a, I, I weighed about 320 something pounds. I picked out a, a junkie who blew up people with hand grenades. Sounds good. So you met Jim and, and that's about a, uh, but no, but then, uh, yeah, but it took me a long time to convince him that we should do this together. It, it, it took me a lot of time and it took, I had a lot of um, people that knew him and his friends and uh, that really, uh, we kind, I kind of had them lobby for it, and, and eventually it, it wasn't that long, but it was like good six, seven, eight months. So it, we, we lobbied, and eventually it worked out. And, I, and I'll tell you who really did a great deal of lobbying was um, a guy named Lou Adler, because I, he hired me to do Rocky Horror Show out in L.A., and, and I brought Jim out. And, I, and uh, Lou actually took me into the studio, and, and I, I did a recording of... Uh, Jailhouse Rock, uh, with this famous saxophone player who's near, I can't remember. And then we did a Jim song. And Lou was responsible for getting Jim out there and making him record. And after Lou, that was kind of it. So that's when it all kind of started. Did you ever think that when you were recording Bats Out of Hell that it would have sold, you know, all these years? No, you don't think that. Because back in, the, back in the day, record companies actually signed you the reason they had long-term contracts is because they intended, if they signed you, to at least do three. And you would hope they would do five before you became a free agent, you know. And now it's no longer that way. But 
But the lecture was at the time, look, your first album will be, we'll try to push it to do so many 70, 50,000, 75,000, 100,000. The second album will try to get, you know, will will elevate the le level. And by the third one, we should probably be able to go gold. And and that was the lecture you got when you signed your, you know, don't expect that your first album is going to do anything. You, you want it to do 50,000, you want it to do 100,000, and that's going to require a lot of work on is your that, Is that what they said to you, meet before they'd heard the final recordings before it was released? Uh, or yeah, basically. Right. Yeah. And even a and after they were gone, you're not going to sell anything. Uh, they, uh, the record company hated it. They, we got signed, but when they finally got to hear it, they hated it. I mean, they hated it. I mean, it was like the guy who ran the... Because Billboard charts at that time were worked. Uh, you know, it was kind of like, well, you should put our album at number six. You, you know, it, was, it had nothing to do with anything other than... It was like a lobbyist in in Washington D.C. You know that coin lobbyist and the oil lobbyist and the insurance and the tobacco and and it was, it was about like lobbying. And well, you know, we we probably should put this Blood, Sweat, and Tears album this week at, at number four, don't you think? And it, it, it could have sold two copies, but it didn't make any difference. It was like, okay, let's do that. And uh, the guy who ran the charts and lobbying for the charts hated it. He hated it. And better to hell in America, it should have been number one for God, who knows, through probably the, uh, in 1978, May, all the way through October. And in Billboard, we never broke the top ten. Record World was a different thing. The guy who lobbied for Record World loved it. And I think we stayed in the top ten for a long time. And the same with the old cash box. We were, but the guy, who made Bill, the guy who lobbied for Billboard hated us really despise us, so we never saw the top ten. And it's like Paradise, Paradise, One Light. Everybody thinks it was a number one single in America, and it wasn't. And and uh, Casey Kaysen, who ran an American Top 40, we got to number 34 or 32, and he, and in his American Top 40, the first time he did the Top 40 charts, he put in a note into the syndication package that went out, get this trash out of the Top 40. <laughs> Well, that's nice. Yeah. I mean, we were, listen, we were, you know, we were, we were fighting heavy, heavyweight battles uh, all the time. Yeah. And it all started with um, uh, a guy for Rolling Stone named Dave Marsh, who um, loved Bruce Springsteen, and because Max Weinberg and Roy Bacon played on Battle of the Hell, um, uh, uh, was just so insulted that they actually played on this record. That he, he, he lobbied against it. I mean, they, Rolling Stone usually reviews the record, what, a month, five weeks in front of the yeah, release? About that. Yeah. about that. Well, the record was slated for release in October. He reviewed it in July. But he had it in for you. There's no question. Oh, but, but, I, but, we, got, but we got him back. We had the we same dentist. Of course you did. We had, we know, we, but, no, but in more ways than one, we had the same dentist ah. in New York. And the dentist loved that of the hell. And, and he used to, it used to be, when you go to the dentist and they use gas, then he, uh, that in hell would be the, the song that he played for all his patients <laughs> under the headphones. And so when Dave Marsh came in, he made sure that he played that out of hell to him. And he, Fantastic. he probably shouldn't say this, he gave him less gas. Brilliant. <laughs> I'm going to give him, give him any, actually. And so, uh, uh, you know, but we fought, we, in America, we fought major battles. Outside of America, we didn't fight so many battles. Um, you know, over here, like Melody Maker, we, they, they kind of didn't appreciate that. But Canada, Australia, those, and then, and then Bat 2 was... Um, 20 million copies? Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Bat 2 was, uh, and then Bat 2, you know, that was, that was number one. They, they couldn't deny it in America. The way they did the charts, they couldn't deny it. And, and uh, Well, you got a Grammy, didn't you? Uh, yeah, we got a Grammy for that, and Bat 3 is yeah. again top 10. And, uh, and again, uh, Bat Three was top ten all over the world again. Even, even in, uh, even in this market where the old guys, <laughs> we don't, we don't. Well, nobody sells records anymore. I mean, last last week, what Mariah Carey in America had the number one album, 125,000 copies. 125,000 copies in 1994 would have put you about 60. Um, yeah, the music business has changed. The yeah. download has changed everything. Is it? And, 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 and nobody 
they don't download albums. They download songs. I mean, I, I, I do the same thing, but I'm, I, I'm researching stuff. So I go in and I, I, I download, well, if you saw, I don't have an iPod, but I have it on my computer. I have the most, the oddest collection of stuff. Let's talk about touring now, because uh, obviously you're hugely popular whenever you tour, and the good news is the Casa de Carne tour, which is the... Yeah, the house, house, house of meat. I love well, it. I, you know what, I just... Uh, somebody informed me yesterday that in, in, in Washington, D.C., that that's how they advertise the red light district in Washington, D.C. I said... That, Casa de Carne. No, no, but, but I said, oh, you mean the house of meat, and they, they said... I said, but it's not Casa de Carne. He said, yeah, it's <laughs> Casa de Carne. I said, are you kidding? <laughs> so uh, I think I was talking to somebody in Nottingham. Um, and so I said, well, when you come to the show, just and he was a, a lady, I said, you know what? I'm going to have the entire stage bathed in red light for, for the Nottingham Brilliant. show. Uh, I probably won't be able to, but it was a good thought. You combine so brilliantly the wonderful music that you've recorded over the years, Bat 1, 2, and 3, presumably in this talk, but you, you bring theater to it, which is a, another part of your natural home, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, I mean, because all the songs are character studies, and they're really, they're character-driven. So it's not an issue like an actor in a movie uh, a lot of times, uh, you, instinct, your instinct watching a movie would say, oh, that was odd, because the actor is forcing something. It's like there's an action that shouldn't necessarily be there, and it's a forced action. Well, with people go, God, he's so over the top, and he's so this, and he's so that. Yes, but it is not, it's not a forced, it's, it can, it can carry it. It can handle it. It's not. It's not all uh, smoke and mirrors. Like a lot of you know, you get the bands, that, and nothing wrong with it, but they have all the pyro and and they're blowing up things and they're doing this and they're doing that, and it, and a lot of times it seems really forced. You're like going, why are they blowing this up here? Why is this laser light going across the sky? And you're asking yourself as you're watching the show, why are they doing that? Well, that's they're cool. They're quite boring without it. Huh? They're probably quite boring without all yeah, that stuff. Yeah, so, so we're over the top, but it's never forced mm. in that issue. There's always a rhyme and a reason for it. What do you prefer, singing or acting, or do you love them both the same? No, I, I, well, I don't, I, I don't think of myself as a singer, so that, that kind of narrows that down. Uh, I, don't, I, can't, I can't sing anything unless I have a character, unless there's a character driving him. It's like you, most singers can just start singing. I can't just start singing. I, I, I gotta have a character, I gotta have a reason. I gotta have a motivation to sing or I, I, I can do it. How do you find acting without singing though? Because you made loads of movies. Oh yeah, well, that, no, movies that, and what have you. Well, that's much easier. Uh, I mean, acting is hard. Don't, don't let anybody ever tell you that, it, that it's not. But I, I, acting is, is, is something that I love. I, I, that's, that's what brought me out of my shell as a kid, really, was because I was really shy. I'm still shy, and uh, I know that's hard to I, believe. I do find that very hard so to believe. It's me. really true. I mean, it's like, I don't know, when I go out, like, to a premiere or to a party, I have no idea what to say to anybody. And, and I'm always really jealous because I'll see these people in here, and they're really talking, and they're really into this conversation. And I sit, and I'm looking at them going, what the hell are they talking about? So you know, I'm always wanting to, you know, go over there and like cop their conversation for the next party I go sure. to. Yeah. Hey, because I never know what to say. I'm always, in, I'm always intimidated at these things, so I just never go anywhere. Well, you're working on this tour. It's going to be June and July, and you, you end up in London. You're in Norwich, York, Nottingham, which you mentioned, uh, where well, you've got to have the red light on the stage. Yeah. Hampshire, Bath, uh, I love in, Bath. in Liverpool, and Plymouth. I'm in Plymouth. Yes. Well, I hope it goes well, and it's a great pleasure. Oh, to me you, too. You I to hope it goes in. well, because I, I tell you, after after getting an assist on my vocal cord and... and I think that must you. Yeah, I'm okay. Think, but it, I thought my life had ended, tell you the truth. Yeah, case. it sounded serious last year. It was. Yeah. And, and, um, but I'm very nervous about the whole thing, about coming back. It's like riding a horse. It's like, you know, you fall off a horse, or have you ever been in a car wreck, and you start yeah. driving down the street, and there's a car that passes, you think it's going to hit you again? And... Um, so I, I'm, I'm nervous about getting back on the horse, but once we get a couple under, the, under our feet, we'll be okay. Good luck. Thanks, Thanks for coming in. Okay.